Good afternoon. My name is Kim Kochis, and I would like to welcome you to the Sutherland webcast, Understanding and Defending State Consumer Protection Actions. I'm a litigation partner in Sutherland's New York office, and I regularly defend insurance companies and other financial services companies in state and federal court against consumer protection actions. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues. My name is Veronica Weiner, and I am an associate at Sutherland Asbel & Brennan. I practice in New York. I primarily focus on commercial litigation, including defending companies against consumer protection actions. Hi, my name is uh, Alexander Fuchs. I'm also a litigation associate here in Sutherland's New York office. I work with uh, Kim and Veronica, representing insurers and other financial service companies um, in a variety of uh, litigation matters, including the defense of consumer protection actions. This is the latest in our series of webcasts devoted to litigation issues faced by the insurance and financial services industries. We'd like to welcome back those of you who have joined us for our previous programs, and we'd like to welcome those of you who are new to the series. If you would like to receive CLE credit for this webinar, please download the CLE sign-in sheet and evaluation form from your viewing council and follow the instructions for submission. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them via the Ask a Question text box on your viewing console. Consumer protection or unfair and deceptive practices statutes have been enacted in every state in an attempt to protect consumers from predatory, deceptive, and unscrupulous business practices. While good intentioned, these laws have had the unintended effect of frivolous lawsuits, particularly given that a number of the statutes allow for attorney's fees and punitive and or treble damages. In today's presentation, we will discuss the proliferation of consumer protection litigation nationwide and provide practice tips on how to defend against those actions. Now, consumer protection statutes go by many names. They may be referred to as consumer sales acts, unfair trade practices, deceptive consumer sales acts, consumer fraud acts, but they all have the same goal, which is to protect consumers, of course. How did state consumer protection statutes evolve? Well, they had some help from the federal government. The Federal Trade Commission Act of 1914 established the Federal Trade Commission. The act, signed into law by Woodrow Wilson in 1913, outlaws unfair methods of competition and outlaws unfair acts or practices that affect commerce. But the act's reach was limited. For instance, the act did not provide a private right of action to enforce the federal ban on unfair and deceptive trade practices. Therefore, the FTC encouraged states to pass their own statutes. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, states began passing consumer protection statutes to extend protection to consumers that they were not receiving from federal laws. Today, all 50 states and the District of Columbia have their own state statutes. They generally provide a private right of action to consumers. These statutes are sometimes referred to as little FTC acts. Now, these statutes were important to the development of consumer protection laws for a few reasons. First, consumers could now file their own causes of action. They did not have to rely on the FTC to pursue deceptive acts claims. Therefore, consumers had the opportunity to become their own private attorney general. Second, little FTC acts opened the courts up to consumers. Prior to the enactment of these statutes, Consumers who had such grievances would have to bring a lawsuit under a common law tort theory. This was difficult because they had to prove that the merchant's false representation of fact, they had to prove an intent to deceive, and justifiable reliance. This was a tall order. Alternatively, consumers could try to bring their claim as a breach of contract based on a misrepresentation or unconscionable provision. However, Merchants could bypass liability by including an as-is provision in a contract. Further, 
the contract approach could not provide adequate damages to the wrong consumer. As I said before, today every state in the District of Columbia now has its own independent consumer private cause of action. State statutes that are modeled after the Federal Trade Commission Act are usually referred to as true little FTCs. For instance, this slide shows the strikingly similarity, similar language of the federal statute when compared to Florida's Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act. However, some states take an alternative approach. They refer to, their, this is referred to as the laundry list approach. These statutes list specific unlawful behaviors. For instance, advertising goods or services with intent not to sell them as advertised, or knowingly make false or misleading statements concerning the need for parts, replacements, or repair services. Some uh, of these laundry list prohibitions can be state specific. For instance, in Alaska, you're prohibited from making any representation that uh, fish is fresh if it is in fact frozen. This is, of course, important to Alaskans. Um, however, most of these laundry list statutes also create a catch-all provision. For instance, in Pennsylvania, there's a list of prohibitions, but also a general provision that prohibits engaging in any other fraudulent or deceptive conduct, which creates a likelihood of confusion or a misunderstanding. So let's talk about what is considered unfair under a consumer protection statute. The majority of states follow something called the cigarette rule, which was created by the FTC. The cigarette rule prohibits practices when the practice offends public policy as it has been established by statutes, common law or otherwise, whether, in other words, it is within at least a penumbra of some common law, statutory, or other established concept of unfairness. An unfair practice is a practice that is immoral, unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous. And third, when a practice causes substantial injury to consumers. Now, in the 1970s, the FTC was very active in uh, prosecuting uh, it's un and uh, making aggressive use of its unfairness authority. This, however, led to political backlash. In 1980, the Senate sent the FTC a letter and informed them that they wanted to curtail their uh, authority. As a result, the FTC came up with something different, an unfairness policy. This revised the cigarette rule. Instead of the prior uh, criteria that I explained, this policy focused and elaborated on substantial injury. It also disavowed the second prong, which as you recall is the requirement that a practice be immoral, unethical, oppressive, or unscrupulous. Finally, it limited public policy prong, the prong, public policy prong to policies that were clear and well established. Now the majority of states still continue to follow the cigarette rule or hybrid form of it. States like Massachusetts, Alaska, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, and others. However, a few other states follow the unfairness policy, um, which is less uh, restrictive. And those states include Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Ohio, and Tennessee. Then there are states that still have not uh, articulated a conclusive standard, such as Georgia, Mississippi, Nebraska, West Virginia, Wisconsin, and Wyoming. Now some of these states, unsurprisingly, have um, 
receive detention for their weak consumer protection laws. What is deceptive? Under the FTCA, a practice is deceptive if it has the likelihood or propensity to mislead. Many states have followed the standard. However, there are some states that uh, have their own standard. For instance, in Massachusetts, uh, the courts have developed their own approach, the so-called raised eyebrow or rascality standard. Under the raised eyebrow standard, the objectionable conduct must attain a level of rascality that would raise an eyebrow of something inured to the rough and tumble world of commerce. Now, what, are exam what have courts find, found as deceptive? Well, a Texas court said that failure to disclose that property was subject to a demolition order was deceptive trade practices, even though the demolition order had been recorded under real property record recording statutes. Or in New York, a court found that a bank who that without notice or proper authority imposed a $3 quarterly fee on accounts with balances below $250 without notifying their customers was deceptive. Now the typical elements of a consumer prote uh, protection statute um, require an unfair or deceptive act, and we just talked about a little bit about what courts have found to be a deceptive act. The act has to occur within trade or commerce, and the act has to cause an injury to the litigant. Thanks, Veronica. Um, so now we're going to take a look at a couple of key questions related to consumer protection laws, um, some of which will overlap with a couple of the points made by Veronica um, and hopefully expand on the specific differences between various states, including uh, which states allow for certain types of suits and um, what those states require. Uh, on this slide, we've grouped a couple of these key questions under the general heading of standing. Now, they don't all necessarily apply to standing, but I think it's a nice framework for looking at these. First question is, who can bring suit? Uh, as Veronica mentioned, the majority of states allow for a private right of action for consumers to enforce um, consumer protection laws, but that's not the case in all states. And in some cases, not all states for both unfair and deceptive practices. The second question is, what can be sued for? Um, some states restrict the subject matter uh, to their, of what their consumer protection laws apply to. Um, generally, and we'll look into this in a little bit, um, household goods or services need to be involved. Um, and in some cases, the, uh, the type of service or good, if it relates to a specific industry, um, aren't covered by the consumer protection law. And that feeds into the third question, who can be sued? Uh, some consumer protection statutes are very broad. They don't contain any specific prohibitions concerning the industry or the, um, the type of business that is covered by the statute, and others are very specific and accept certain, certain types of businesses which we'll look at. That can include insurers, banks, credit unions, um, and public utilities. So who can bring to? As I mentioned, not every consumer protection statute provides a private right of action. Uh, and again, some of these statutes will allow a private right of action with respect to unfair practices or to deceptive practices, but not to both. And partially that's because some states have developed law in which unfair practices and deceptive practices are covered by two related but separate statutes. Um, in the absence of a private right of action, enforcement of consumer protection statutes generally falls to the attorney general of a given state or to another state agency. Uh, in some cases, states have uh, developed and enacted laws which have created uh, consumer protection bureaus, essentially, that operate as an enforcement mechanism for these, for these statutes. In 48 states in the District of Columbia, um, 
consumer protection statutes provide a private right of action that allow consumers to sue for either deceptive or unfair acts. Now, obviously, that's the vast majority of states. Um, generally, that right is coextensive with the right of the Attorney General or Consumer Protection Bureau, excuse me, Bureau to, um, to also bring an action for enforcement. Some of the, the rights when an action is brought by a consumer and when an action is brought by an Attorney General or um, the state are slightly different, and we'll try to touch on a couple of those differences as we go forward. Um, two states, uh, Iowa and Texas, have adopted consumer protection statutes but do not, in all cases, allow for a private right of action. Iowa, in particular, does not allow a private right of action at all and only permits the Attorney General to bring an enforcement action. And I've, there's a little bit of an excerpt from the Iowa statute there that, uh, that shows how they've worded their consumer protection statute and why it's been interpreted to only allow for the Attorney General to bring an action. Um, if we look at uh, this slide, we've got a couple of excerpts from, from different statutes, uh, Mississippi, Missouri, and New Jersey's uh, consumer protection statutes, which show uh, some interesting points. Um, first, they all provide for a private right of action. And if you look at Missouri and Mississippi, you can see, and I think Veronica covered this a little bit, because many of these statutes are adopted from model rules and from the FTC rules, uh, a lot of them are very similar. So Mississippi's and Missouri's uses almost identical language. Um, but there are some key points that you need to that need to be understood in, in terms of who can bring a consumer protection private action. Um, generally, the action has to involve uh, the lease or the purchase of goods or services. Um, that's pretty simple because these things have to involve trade or commerce. The second point would be that they have to be for personal, family, or household purposes. Um, this is really hammers home the consumer point of the consumer protection statute. These aren't meant to be mechanisms for business-to-business uh, -business suits, although um, uh, in some cases partnerships or um, limited companies can bring suit under the statutes. But generally, these are reserved for individual consumers. Um, some statutes even go as far as to define it as uh, an individual or a husband and wife, um, which may be a little bit outdated. Uh, in this day and age, um, but that's a key component of this. So it's going to be uh, an individual person suing a company um, generally for a uh, deceptive or an unfair practice. Um, Missouri and Mississippi obviously include a lot of uh, specific language and criteria for their, their statutes. Um, New Jersey's is obviously a little bit uh, more succinct. So every state statute is going to differ in some, in some ways. Some will have very similar language. Um, some will be use completely different language, uh, be much more succinct. And in many cases, the case law that's developed around these statutes is going to create a lot of distinctions. Um, so even if the language, for instance, in Mississippi and Missouri's uh, consumer protection statutes is very similar, the end result may be very different based on how the courts have interpreted these statutes over the years. So this isn't um, uh, very different from what Veronica uh, had in her earlier slide concerning the requirements for private right of action. Generally involves a person or a, um, a family, a husband and wife. It has to involve a purchase of um, a good or services, a good or service, and that purchase generally includes leasing, renting, um, any kind of transaction generally. Uh, an injury has to be suffered as a result of that, that purchase, and the injury has to be caused by a deceptive or unfair act or practice. I mean, that's pretty, pretty straightforward, pretty simple, um, but those are the general elements involved. Now, some states also require uh, some additional criteria, um, either before an individual can bring a private action or as part of the elements of a private right of action. Um, in some states, reliance is required uh, in order to bring an action. So you must show that you relied on the deceptive or unfair act, and that was what caused the injury. Excuse me. Um, that's going to vary from state to state. Um, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, and Wyoming all require a showing of reliance. Other states um, may require reliance under certain circumstances. So it's, um, 
it's really just about looking at the individual states. I mean, I guess maybe a general uh, caveat for this entire presentation is that this law is incredibly state-specific in many ways, um, and there's going to be a lot of nuances that vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So what we're providing is largely just kind of an overview um, of the, the landscape. But um, you could fill an entire hour to two-hour presentation just delving into the individual state consumer protection statutes. So what can be sued for? <laughs> and the, again, in a broad sense, uh, deceptive or unfair practices. But what those um, deceptive and unfair practices are vary, again, between the states. Um, as I think Veronica pointed out, there are the laundry list states and there are the broad states. Um, the Missouri statute, yet again, is a very broad statute that covers basically any deception, fraud, false pretense, false promise, and misrepresentation. Um, they don't specifically list any individual acts or practices that would be considered deceptive or unfair, uh, but those have been interpreted by the courts and um, subsequent, uh, subsequent rulings have, have given somewhat of a framework for, for when a uh, deceptive act of practice would fall under the statute. In contrast to that, you have Colorado's Consumer Protection Act, uh, which prescribes 62 specific acts that constitute deceptive trade practices. Now, Colorado, unlike, I think, Pennsylvania, which Veronica discussed, doesn't have a catch-all provision. These 62 acts are the um, extensive are the complete list of the acts that constitute a deceptive trade practice. So if you don't fall within those, um, the act itself is not deceptive. That's nice from a um, defense standpoint, because it obviously provides a very, uh, a very easy reference point for looking at what those, those acts are and um, whether or not a specific uh, claim would fall underneath them. Um, from the perspective of consumers, obviously, that's, that's somewhat limiting. Um, I know Veronica discussed uh, fish in relation to Alaska. Um, some of the Colorado rules include, or actually include um, knowingly failing to identify flood damage or water damaged goods. Um, and my personal favorite, uh, soliciting door to door as a seller, unless the seller within 30 seconds after beginning the conversation identifies him or herself, uh, whom she represents and the purpose of the call. Uh, it really doesn't get much more specific than that. Uh, so it's just interesting how different states approach their consumer protection laws. Um, Indiana and Oregon also offer a list um, of acts that qualify as deceptive or unfair practices. So those states are, are fairly easy to point to and, and see exactly what would, what would qualify. Um, the states that use more general language it requires a little more uh, research, a little more um, interpretation in order to figure out exactly what's going to qualify. Um, again, this is a general versus specific question. Uh, some laws and, and consumer protection statutes uh, apply broadly. They have no specific um, exceptions for businesses. They apply to any act in, in trade or commerce. Uh, others have very, may even have broad language, but then specifically exempt certain industries from regulation. Generally, those industries are also regulated uh, either by the state or by the federal government in some way. Um, some of the, uh, some of the states often use different terminology with respect to who can be sued. Um, supplier is a, in the Kansas Consumer Protection Statute. Um, merchant is in another Consumer Protection Statute. Other ones are personal or, person or individual. So depending on the terminology that's used, that can also be interpreted narrowly or very broadly. Uh, if we want to look at some of the industries that are specifically uh, exempted, uh, under the Kansas uh, Consumer Protection Act, again, they use supplier. Um, but a supplier does not include a bank, trust company, lending institution, or lending institution, excuse me, that are uh, subject to state or federal regulation. So that kind of cuts out a broad swath of uh, industries from coverage under the um, consumer protection statute. And a lot of consumer disputes are going to involve um, 
suits against banks, trust companies, or lending institutions. So that um, while the while the consumer protection statute may, excuse me, provide a great deal of coverage for other acts and practices, it also leaves a pretty wide gap. Um, Missouri's Merchandise and Practices Act also provides an exception for uh, companies that are regulated by the Department of Insurance, uh, financial institutions, and professional registration, and also Division of Credit Unions. So again, another large swath of industries are cut out from coverage under that statute. Um, the next slide. This is a list of 25 states that whose computer, excuse me, consumer protection statutes do not apply to the insurance industry. Um, so about roughly half the consumer protection statutes don't apply to don't apply to insurers. Now, while that might provide a great deal of comfort to insurers when faced with um, a potential claim under a consumer protection statute, the reality is a little more muddled. Um, for instance, we recently defended a case in Missouri under the Missouri Merchandise and Practices Act for an insurance company in which um, the plaintiffs brought a, or tried to bring a claim under the Missouri Merchandise and Practices Act. Um, we obviously argued that our client was exempted from coverage um, uh, under the act and ultimately did win, but through briefing in that case, we came to find that there were letters issued by the Department of uh, Insurance in Missouri and um, some lower court cases that actually interpreted the Merchandising Practices Act to apply to insurers. Um, I mean, these were the minority, and um, they really hadn't gained much traction. And the Court of Appeals of the Supreme Court hadn't dealt with the issue, but there was this minority of opinions out there that um, that would allow the act to apply. So even even though the, the plain language may seem to um, exempt an industry or provide some uh, protection, it's always good to kind of delve into the issues and do the research and um, really get into the nuances of the individual states because you may come to find that even though that's a plain language, in the ensuing 20 to 30 years that have, um, have passed since the law was, was enacted, uh, there have been some quirky decisions issued by trial courts that may cause some problems. Um, I just interrupt for one second, Alex. For those of you that are going to want to receive CLE credit for this webinar, the confirmation code for today's webinar is PROTECTION. So you can use that code on the sign-in sheet, which you can download from the viewing console, and just write the word PROTECTION on the sheet. Thanks. Um, again, similarly, uh, certain states exempt uh, issuers of credit from, from consumer protection laws. Uh, I won't go through each individual state. I think they're, they're pretty straightforward. Um, I will note that these lists are not exhaustive. There may be additional states, but we want to provide a representative sample of the states that do um, exclude these industries. Uh, same thing for utility providers. In 26 states, they're exempted from, um, from consumer protection laws. Uh, and then the next topic we'll get into is uh, damages and attorney's fees. Um, I mean, this is really the, uh, the big portion of the consumer protection laws because this is simultaneously um, the part that's going to hurt your wallet if consumer protection law is brought against you, but also it's, it's what provides the incentive for so many of these suits to be filed by consumers, either because they're actually trying to vindicate their rights or as is in most cases, um, the damages and attorney's fees that can be claimed under these statutes provide a strong incentive for the plaintiff's bar to um, bring, I won't say frivolous uh, actions, but um, to bring quite a few, of ac few actions under these, under these laws. So the type of damages that are generally available under consumer protection laws are compensatory damages, statutory damages, punitive, and treble damages. Um, not all are available under every law, so we'll go through those a little bit in the next couple of slides. Uh, attorney's fees are also generally available under most consumer protection statutes, although, and again, we'll cover this in, uh, in, the next, in the next few slides, not all consumer protection statutes do award attorney's fees, and in some cases, some allow attorney's fees to be awarded to the prevailing party, regardless of whether it's a consumer or the defendant, uh, which can provide a somewhat, um, I won't say unfair result for consumers, but 
but certainly can um, disincentivize bringing consumer protection uh, actions. Uh, and then finally, can a plaintiff recover costs? Again, generally, along with attorney's fees, costs are usually awarded at the discretion of the court. So compensatory damages are almost universally allowed in, um, in uh, consumer protection action, uh, excuse me, consumer protection actions when there is a private right of action. Uh, it generally allows um, consumers to recover their actual losses or the uh, injury that they suffered. Uh, in some cases, statutes also provide a statutory award. This is usually a relatively small amount, and as you can see in the Colorado statute, um, is usually an either-or situation. Either you get the actual damages that you sustained or the, um, the statutory amount, and that's just to incentivize consumers to bring actions for disputes um, or injuries that would be of a, of a nominal value. Uh, punitive damages are, um, are a little more dependent on the jurisdiction. They're to punish the defendant, generally require a form of willfulness or reckless disregard. Um, some of the statutes affirmatively provide for punitive damages. Others are silent, and then it will, be, it will depend on the particular law of the jurisdiction, whether they allow punitive damages in that form of action. Uh, and then a handful of states specifically prohibit punitive damages in consumer protection actions. Um, so on this slide, we've got a list of states that, um, that do allow for punitive damages in consumer protection actions. That's either explicitly uh, in their consumer protection statute or um, through silence in the statute and just general availability in that jurisdiction of law. Um, other states, as I mentioned, specifically prohibit punitive damages in consumer protection statutes. Um, Florida, Hawaii, Maine, Minnesota, this list provides a, a general grouping of these states. There are a few others that we don't have on here. Uh, Nebraska has an asterisk because they don't allow damages of any form um, in consumer protection actions. There is a private right of action, but you can only seek injunctive relief. So they do prohibit punitive damages. They also prohibit compensatory or statutory damages. Um, now, treble damages are a somewhat related concept to punitive damages, uh, but also slightly different. Again, this is to punish willful um, or reckless conduct on the part of a defendant. And generally, the statute will specifically note that will allow for the doubling or tripling of damages under certain circumstances. Um, Again, we have a non-exhaustive list of the states that provide for treble damages. Um, Idaho, uh, for instance, or actually, excuse me, Indiana, for instance, um, allows for treble damages, but only in cases where the claim relates to an elderly or disabled person. So these states generally allow treble damages, but again, you have to kind of delve into the nuances of them to see if there are specific um, situations where trouble damages would be allowed or not allowed, whether the plaintiff meets the criteria of the statute that would uh, allow for the trouble of damages. Uh, attorney's fees and costs, as I mentioned, um, they're generally allowed under consumer protection statutes. I mean, there's a strong, the majority of these statutes provide or are seeking to provide a strong incentive for consumers to pursue, um, pursue an action to vindicate their rights in court. Um, part of that is to allow for the recovery of attorney's fees and costs. Generally, that's at the discretion of the court. And courts, assuming that a, a consumer protection action is brought in good faith and is um, successful, will generally award attorney's fees and costs. Obviously, that's a boon to the plaintiff's bar. Um, it allows them a, uh, a clear path to being paid provides them with an incentive to um, find plaintiffs to bring these actions, whether they are um, merit, uh, have merit or, or don't. But there are a handful of states that don't allow for attorney's fees. We have those listed below. Arizona, Delaware, Iowa, Mississippi, South Dakota, and Wyoming uh, don't allow for attorney's fees and costs. Iowa, uh, because I mentioned earlier, because there is no private right of action, that's partially why they don't allow for attorney's fees and costs. 
the only individual who would be bringing an action to enforce that consumer protection statute would be the Attorney General. Um, and the final, uh, final slide for uh, at least my portion of the presentation is whether or not consumer protection statutes can be brought as a class action. Um, generally, the answer is yes. Uh, again, most, excuse me, um, many statutes will specifically provide um, for class actions to be brought. Uh, others are silent on the issue, and then it will fall to the uh, class action rules and regulations within that specific jurisdiction. Uh, but for the majority of states and the majority of consumer protection laws, a class action uh, can be brought. However, there are, again, a few states that do specifically prohibit class action. And in addition, there are a few others where the damages that can be recovered, be they stat statutory or treble, only apply to an individual action. Um, so again, for the most part, class actions will be allowed, but um, it's important to look at the individual state laws to see if um, how the damages portion of the statute interacts with the allowance for class actions. Now that we've compared and contrasted various consumer protection statutes and talked about the incentives plaintiff's counsels have to bring these types of actions, we thought it might be useful to do a deeper dive into one particular statute. And the one statute we chose was New York's Consumer Protection Law, GBL Section 349, which is very near and dear to our hearts as we all practice in New York and regularly defend cases in this area. GBL 349 is the most common New York State Consumer Protection Statute for corporations to be sued under. You will often see GBL 349 suits added as a tag-along claim with fraud, tortious interference, defamation, or even breach of contract claims. The intent of GBL 349 is to empower consumers to level the playing field. It basically allows them to be private attorney generals. The aim is to secure an honest marketplace. It's intentionally broad to cover virtually all economic activity. This is the specific definition of 349, which is incredibly broad. Deceptive acts or practices in the conduct of any business, trade, or commerce or in the furnishing of any service in the state are hereby declared unlawful. It's not very helpful if you're trying to decipher how to comply with this statute. It's very broad, but luckily New York courts have tried, with varying levels of success, to not open the floodgates to litigation. So who can sue under GBL 349? The New York Attorney General can bring an action, but in addition, there's a private right of action, and that private right of action can be brought by any person who has been injured. Person under GBL 349 statute has been interpreted very broadly. It can be a corporation, it can be an individual, it can even be a competitor. If it's a competitor, however, the competitor has to also show public harm and injury to themselves. This competitor portion is much broader than other states' consumer protection statutes. While the statute is very broad, the deceptive acts or practices must occur in New York. So what does that mean? Well, for example, if it's a New York company and they're doing, conducting Internet sales where the consumer purchased the goods or services out of state and there is no relationship with New York other than the seller being in New York, that's probably not going to be sufficient to state a claim under 349. They weren't trying to develop, the New York legislature wasn't trying to develop a nationwide consumer protection law. It was really focused on specific conduct within the state of New York. In addition, the suit must be brought within three years. It's a three-year statute of limitations. Now, that three-year statute of limitations can be told if there's some sort of fraudulent concealment. There are three elements to a 349 claim. The actor practice must be consumer-oriented, the actor practice must be misleading in a material way, and there must be some sort of injury caused by the deception. Seems pretty simple, but as we break them down, you'll see that it's not quite as simple as it seems. It's important to note that when you are defending one of these cases and determining whether or not you want to move to dismiss, the 349, even though it seems like it might be a fraud type of claim, is not actually subject to a heightened pleading requirement in either state or federal court. So if you're in federal court, you still have to survive Iqbal Twombly, but there won't be that heightened fraud requirement. Um, 
Let's go through each element. So first, consumer-oriented. What does consumer-oriented mean? Well, the definition of consumer-oriented means a broad impact on consumers. There's no magic number, however, to how many consumers must be deceived. 349 does not require repetition or pattern of deceptive conduct. It does, however, not allow private contract disputes which are unique to the parties. Private contract disputes are not consumer-oriented. And this is a, a key defense in these actions if the interaction between the consumer and the defendant is about a contract, a contract that only affects the parties to that contract. Now, while private contract disputes unique to the parties aren't consumer-oriented, this does not mean that, for example, an insurance contract or another contract where the contract language applies to a large number of consumers cannot be interpreted as consumer-oriented if the allegations could apply to more than merely the plaintiff bringing the suit. It's an important distinction. While the scope of the statute is very broad and applies to almost all economic activity, New York courts are not uniform as to whether 349 can apply to securities transactions. In general, courts have reasoned that securities transactions should not be covered by consumer protection laws because securities are purchased as investments, not as goods to be consumed or used, and therefore are subject to federal securities laws. The New York courts are not uniform on that interpretation. Moving on to the second element of deception. What is a deceptive act? Well, it can be a representation or it can be an omission. Anything likely to mislead a reasonable consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances. And that's actually a heightened standard than when 349 was originally enacted. So what's the key? A reasonable consumer acting reasonably. The deception also must be material. It can't be a misrepresentation or omission that isn't material in some way. It doesn't have to lay it to rise to the level of fraud, however. And that's one of the reasons why this statute is so popular with plaintiff's lawyers. Plaintiffs don't need to show fraud. They don't need to show intent. In fact, they don't even need to show recklessness. And they can still bring a successful 349 claim. That said, conduct cannot be deemed deceptive if it was fully disclosed. For example, in Sands versus Ticketmaster, the first department dismissed a 349 claim where the alleged excessive fees were disclosed. So in that case, Ticketmaster charged plaintiffs in the putative class a number of fees, but the court found that because Ticketmaster had actually disclosed those fees, there could be no deception. So there can be no deception if the bad act was fully disclosed. Something to remember if you're ever sued in a 349 case. You really need to look at what were the facts surrounding the deceptive act and is it possible that deception was disclosed in some way, whether it be in um, the insurance contract or at like Ticketmaster on the ticket itself or in something that a consumer signed. And then finally, injury. This is probably the most complicated aspect of GBL 349. First, the injury can't be derivative. Now what does that mean? A derivative injury is when the loss arises solely as a result of injuries sustained by another. This is very confusing and it's worth discussing in a little bit more detail. There's two New York Court of Appeals cases that talk about derivative and what a derivative injury is. The first case discussing derivative injury was in 2004 in Blue Cross and Blue Shield versus Philip Morris. And it really explained what a der derivative injury is. In Blue Cross, the Court of Appeals found that the plaintiff insurance plan could not recover medical payments made on behalf of its members who suffered from smoking-related illnesses, even though the defendant's misrepresentations as to the negative health effects of smoking caused the injury. So while the plan could show that it was injured, it incurred all the medical costs associated with the individuals that had health-related issues from smoking, the injury was indirect because the losses arose as a result of the smoking-related illnesses suffered by its members, not the actual plan. In 2009, in City of New York versus Smoke's Spirits, the New York Court of Appeals again addressed derivative injury. In this action, New York City claimed that defendants illegally marketed and shipped cigarettes into New York without paying tax revenue. In this case, the court found that New York City's injury was solely indirect. Had the allegedly deceived consumers not been improperly induced to purchase defendant cigarettes, then the city would have had no claim to lost tax revenue. While New York's injury was caused by defendant's conduct, the injury under 349 requires more than just a but-for causation. The court for therefore dismissed the action as only alleging derivative injury. So not only can the 
injury not be derivative. But the claimed deception cannot be the only injury. There must be some sort of actual harm. It doesn't need to be pecuniary harm, but there must be some sort of harm alleged. So, for example, in Singleton versus Tito's Handmade Vodka, a class of consumers alleged that Tito's Handmade Vodka label and website falsely represented it that it was handmade or homemade. The Northern District of New York found that plaintiff's alleged injury of paying more for a product that he believed was handmade when it was not constituted an injury, at least at the pleading stage. But if you compare that with, for example, Vigiletti versus Sears, which was also a class case, which was actually dismissed, and it related to allegations that Sears marketed its craftsman tools as made in the USA, even though components of the products were made outside the United States. In that case, the court dismissed the case because the plaintiffs had failed to prove actual injury because they didn't allege any inflated price for the tools. They also didn't allege that they actually saw any of the USA advertising or that any of the transactions occurred in New York. So again, you're gonna, if you're looking at deception and going to try to defend or move to dismiss based on deception, you really need to look at the specific facts of the case and what was actually pled and not pled. In addition, an injury for 349 cannot be duplicative of injury for breach of contract. So although a monetary loss is sufficient injury to satisfy the requirements under 349, that loss must be independent of the loss caused by the alleged breach of contract. And there's a long line of cases that basically states that a 349 claim cannot survive when the plaintiff alleges 349 injuries that are duplicative of their breach of contract injuries. So what does that mean? Well, for example, in Sokoloff versus Town Sports, the appellate division in New York dismissed a health club member's deceptive practices claim made against her health club. The member sought the return of her initiation fee. The court held that the member did not claim a sufficient injury because she alleged no other loss besides the payment of her membership fee. She did not, fail, she did not claim that the health club failed to deliver services called for under the contract, and she never sought to cancel the contract. So there, it was just an issue relating to breach of contract. There was nothing separate and distinct from it. But recently, in September 2015, the Second Circuit in Orlander v. Staples clarified that while a case may be dismissed where the plaintiff's alleged damages are solely the amount of the purchase price of the contract, if the defendant also were denied services, then it can survive a motion to dismiss. So it's something to pay close attention to when you're actually litigating these cases as to what kind of damages are alleged and are there distinct damages. If you have breach of contract in 349, is there some sort of plus factor that is alleged in order to survive some sort of a motion to dismiss or certainly summary judgment. Okay, so what kind of damages can you get for 349? And this is why 349 is so often added on or a tag along to other cases because you can get reasonable attorney's fees and costs. You can get punitive damages in some circumstances. You can get injunctive relief. And then you can get your actual damages or $50, whichever is greater. You can even get both. And they can also treble the damages. So there's a lot of opportunities here for plaintiff's counsel to take advantage of a 349 claim. Also, there's an additional fairly, fairly heavy civil penalty imposed for any violation if it's perpetrated against anyone that's elderly, something to keep in mind. So I thought this was just an interesting case. It was a 2015 New York State Supreme case that was recently issued relating to data privacy, something that you see in the headlines all the time. So in this case, the New York Supreme Court dismissed the 349 claim. And it dismissed the 349 claim because the class alleged that the health care providers failed to adequately protect confidential medical records and personal information. And they said that this failure to protect was misleading or was deceptive because the health organizations had given the plaintiffs privacy notices and different, and different policies saying that this information would be kept confidential. The court found, however, that that's not actionable because those types of notices can't constitute a guarantee. So therefore, there can be no material deception. If you read enough 349 cases, you'll find that it's very, very fact-specific. So what kind of defenses do you have? Well, you want to look at the statute of limitations. You want to look at the elements. If you survive a motion to dismiss and you, your case is moving forward past the pleading stage, then the elements for 349 should be your roadmap to the affirmative discovery that you need to conduct. Was the alleged deception actually disclosed? 
Can you get customer affidavits nullifying the claims of deception? Do you need an expert to support your claims? So these are all things you're going to need to examine if, you're, if you move to dismiss and it's unsuccessful. You need to also look, as we discussed, whether or not this is a derivative. Are the injuries only derivative? And then finally, preemption. 349 was not intended to provide a private cause of action where none exists under a statute. So for example, if the claim is purely based on a violation of a statute, then 349 would be preempted. It's not intended to create private causes of action where none exists. So wrapping up 349, one of the things that we're going to be keeping an eye on is right now there's a current Senate bill in committee to amend 349. And the bill would expand the law to include unconscionable acts and practices. It would authorize the court to award punitive damages affirmatively. It would also affirm affirmatively authorize class actions, although as you'll see if you look into this case law, the class actions are commonly brought under 349. And it will provide enhanced penalties for entities that intentionally violate an injunction. It also will increase the law's recoverable damages and penalty amounts. Like for example, right now minimum damages is $50. That would increase to $500. Here are a list of common defenses you should think about when defending your client. First, whether the state statute provides for a private right of action. This goes back to something Alex was talking about. Um, if you're a bank and you're in Kansas, you know, plaintiff is out of luck. If you're a utility provider in Ohio, case dismissed. If you're an insurer in New Hampshire, uh, case dismissed. Uh, so really this is uh, basic stuff, going back to the state statute and seeing whether you know, uh, there, a private right exists. Because again, some of these plaintiff's attorneys uh, bring these suits in various states and they can't keep track of what state uh, provides a private action for whom. And so really some diligence in this area can um, lead to an early dismissal. Second, you can argue that if plaintiff is seeking injunction, there's nothing to enjoin because the practice at issue has ceased. For instance, there have been a lot of cases where plaintiffs have alleged that a defendant uh, wrongfully said that a piece of clothing was made in the USA when it was in fact made in China or India. So if, if you're a defendant, you could say, well, we stopped this pra practice, judge. We took all of those genes off to the market and we've uh, corrected the labels. So really damages are minimal and you know, this case deserves a quick settlement or maybe even a dismissal. Next, you should consider whether uh, the practice has already been decided by a regulator. For instance, Kim and I recently had a case in New York where we argued that the practice at issue had already been decided by the insurance commissioner in our favor. So this would require you know, looking into the regs, uh, looking into uh, any new developments that have happened um, that maybe if they're not in your favor, the insurance commissioner or whatever regulator is still leaning toward uh, something that would result in dismissal of your, client, of your case. Finally, you want to think about arguing whether the misrepresentation, for instance, uh, at issue is really just puffery. For instance, if you have a window cleaner and your client says it's the best window cleaner in the world, well, of course, no one should be taking that seriously. That's just marketing. It's not a misrepresentation and frankly, Judge, it's just wasting, we're wasting our time here. Um, think about if you can make those arguments. And finally, we wanted to hit on a couple of practice tips in our last minute here. And um, you know, one of the first things we do when we see a complaint that has 349 or any unfair trade practices allegations in it is we look to see what our removal options are. Frequently, plaintiffs are, especially if it's a class, ask, class action, asking for a significant amount of damages. So you know, is removal possible under either diversity or CAFA? And two, does it make sense in this case? Um, you know, if you're already in your commercial court, then maybe you want to remove, maybe you don't to federal court. But depending on where your court is, you definitely want to take a look at and, and make an educated decision as to whether or not you want to remove that case. Second, the pleading standard. Um, you know, 
again, where are we? Are we in federal court? Are we in state court? What do plaintiffs need to show with respect to each of the elements? Um, making sure that they've actually done their job and adequately pled each element. Defenses, we talked a little bit about, about these throughout. Have you applied the statute of limitations? Have you looked to see if this action even applies or if there's some sort of exception for your industry, like if you're in the insurance industry? Um, things like that you want to take a look at for, for each action. And finally, experts. Do you need to line up any experts? These, these are consumer issues. Do you need a consumer expert? Do you need an economist? Do you need an actuary? What do you need to properly defend this case? Get the experts lined up as soon as possible if you think it could survive a motion to dismiss. And with that, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope you'll join us for our upcoming presentation in this series. As a reminder, if you'd like to receive CLE credit for this webinar, please download the CLE sign-in sheet and evaluation form from your viewing council and follow the instructions for submission. And again, the CLE credit word for today is protection. So if you have any questions, please contact any of the speakers. Thank you.